Last Sunday afternoon, we were talking a little bit about sermons and what somebody might preach on last week. And it came very clearly into my heart about an incident that happened several years ago. We had taken the last group from the Methodist Hour radio and TV series to the Holy Land. And a couple from our church went along. And if I'd called their name, you'd know them very well. But anyway, the husband of this particular couple is a daring soul. And so the Holy Land is very unique in that you can be in Jerusalem and in just a few minutes in the desert and just a few minutes at a seaside. It takes a little longer to get to the Dead Sea. And when we got to the Dead Sea, I was kind of astonished because for some reason, in my mind, I thought the Dead Sea was just a little pond, kind of like one of the country ponds. Actually, when you look at it, it's more like looking at the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the Dead Sea is dead because it neither gives nor receives. That's interesting, isn't it? Right now, it's giving whether it likes it or not because they're mining the salt out of the Dead Sea. So it's slowly but surely leaving us. I think that's sad. But there was only one person from the Wells group bold enough to go into the water. And he put on his little uh, flowered bathing suit and went running out there. And his son went along too. And uh, jumped in the water and came right back up. Boom! You know, just like a cork, a fishing cork. Uh, then he tried again. Boom! He'd come right back up to the surface. Uh, and when he came in, he literally came bearing salt. Uh, they're covered with salt. That's how salty the water is. Now, this person is one of these people that has to figure everything out. I don't know if you know anybody like that. He said, it is very interesting to me because one cannot sink in that water. It seems to me that something of the essential property of that water is to lift you back up again. And so you try to push yourself down, and it pushes you right back up. I thought to myself, that's not bad, faith and salt water because faith has some interesting functions. One of them is to look out. You know, it's interesting to us, because you and I live in a day and time where we do a lot of looking, but very little seeing. Let me give you an illustration. You're driving down the street, you've driven down 10, 20, 30, 100 times. And this particular day, you happen to be a little bit more alert, and you see a house you never saw. Or you pass a garden that's been there all the time, and you never noticed it. The lookout sense of faith the look out of direction of faith has to do with the will of the mind and the openness of the heart, to see beyond the ordinary, to see more than what the passing glance of the eye allows. So that faith is a looking out into the reality of creation, the reality of God's world, the amazing world that was made out of the unseen things. We say, I don't believe in the unseen and yet, how many of you believe in atoms? I've never seen one. They tell me that these days, that there are devices, I think electron microscopes, I'm not sure if that's correct, but devices that will say to you that we can actually see the atom, but in seeing that, we have come to understand that it has other properties and dimensions of reality that are a part of the atomic structure that we still haven't seen. And yet, sometimes we'll say, I haven't seen God, so God doesn't exist. And in the same rationale, one might say, I haven't seen the world, because it doesn't really exist. It only appears to exist. Well, you can take that and run with it. But you sometimes need to understand that faith is looking into, looking into the real person that we are, looking into the potential for good, looking into the reality of darkness, and sometimes to the very real self-centeredness, the selfishness that sort of marks our time and our way. We're a strange bundle of a lot of things, and faith says to us, look at yourself. Once you've looked at God, you tend to look at yourself in a different fashion. Look at God, and you see that you are created for a specific purpose. Look at God and find that the self that you are, the person that you are, with all of its amazing complexities, was intended by God, called into being by God, and even more than that, is kept in being by God. It's not just the God who makes us and abandons us. Somehow or the other, it's the God who makes all things and oversees all things and participates in all things and is part of and partner in all of creation. 
So it's not looking at the bad stuff to see the bad. It's looking at the bad stuff to confess in humility that we need God. Let's see. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that just doesn't mean bad things. We've talked about that. Uh, it means good things that you didn't do or good things that you could have done or noble things that you might have thought or noble deeds that you might have performed. It means missing the mark. It means taking aim and shooting in the wrong direction. It means a lot of things. But what it does is it reminds us that we need God, that we need God's grace, that we need God's new life gift to us. So faith says looking out causes one to look in, and looking in causes one to desire to be blessed. I always like the story of Jacob and the wrestling match with the angel, because I didn't like Jacob very much when I first knew him. Sorry, so-and-so, really. And maybe this was a part of his spiritual development and spiritual growth. Comes to this creek, this brook, this river, and he has this wrestling match all night long. It was a real championship wrestling match. <laughs> Let me tell you why. We knew how it was going to come up. But Jacob didn't. When you wrestle with the world or when you wrestle with God, let me tell you something. God is going to win. God's going to win every time. But the, the, the match is real. You know, the encounter is actual and all that kind of stuff. But what old Jacob said was, in the midst of all this, I mean, he got a kung fu chop, knocked his hip out and all this kind of stuff, and so he's still trying to do this thing. And this is what he says to the divine in that encounter. I will not let you go until you bless me. Let me say it again. I will not let you go until you bless me. How many of you, in the midst of your personal present pain and woundedness, have been able to stand and to say, even with a limp in your standing, I'm not letting you go, God until you bless me and you bless this experience so that I can see light on the other side of it. When Jesus was ascended, this is Ascension Sunday, he said he lifted his hands up to bless them. It's what's on the front of our bulletin. If somebody is standing in front of you with your hands lifted up, you pretty much are going to have to look up a little teeny bit. And so you look up in order to be blessed. I think that's neat. I have an official announcement to make. Our youngest daughter was officially engaged this last week. She didn't tell us until last night, but we found out, you know. Uh, Shelly is going to be married. I think we told you about that. We're going to get married, but she just got officially engaged. The ring came in. Um, and she said that Haley knelt on the moldy floor of their FEMA trailer uh, and said, I've loved you from the... Wow, I didn't know I could going to get that. From the moment I saw you, will you marry me? Um, and he looked up to the person he loved. That's what you and I do in faith to God, to look up to the God who would bless us, to look up to the God who would strengthen us, to look up the God, to the God who will equip us, who will make us ready, who will make us able for the living of these days. Every saint of the church is not some strong, courageous hero that you read about in books. It's some broken person equipped again by the power of God to do what is necessary for the good of others and eventually for the good of God's creation. And so the life of faith is to be blessed by coming into the uplifted blessing that God has ready for you and for me now. Despite your loss, despite your sorrow, despite your sickness, despite your sin, despite your darkness, despite our, that's where we really ought to say it. There's the blessing waiting. Kneel down and look up in its face and say, God, I've come to love you. I want a relationship. Is it possible? One thing more and we're done. I think one of the beautiful things about faith in salt water is that salt water keeps on lifting you up. It's the property of Salt water to somehow or the other lift. Also has some healing property, doesn't it? You know, it's yucky, but it heals. Um, maybe one of you can take that and run with it sometime. Make a good sermon out of it. I love this passage that says, we set our minds on things that are above. When you really experience faith, you want to lift up too. Lift up other people. When's the last time you said something really intentionally nice to the people you love? You know, you've been there for me. You have such a sweet spirit. 
You take it and think of it. When's the last time you've lifted up your church? Lots of you are good about that. Or your job. There's a song that says, look for the beautiful and seek to find the true. Let me tell you, if you look for the ugly, you're going to find plenty of it. And sometimes I think we are stuck in ugly. Sometimes I think we're stuck in looking for all the negative stuff. And we have become a very cynical people, many of us. And all lifting up says, look for something. Look for the beautiful and seek to find the true. Don't be satisfied with ugly. Become yourself an illustration of beauty, a piece of art. Ronnie, are you here? Ronnie, Lindsay, I haven't seen him for a couple of days. Uh, Ronnie is going to be presenting a beautiful painting, watercolor painting, for our anniversary next week of these windows. Um, it's been amazing to me how long it takes to make something beautiful. How many hours he has stood here with his little vinyl spread here and his stand trying to capture the light in those windows and the little Christ candle and the flame of the candle. You know, the problem with us is we want instant beauty. We want everything to be right instantly, but it doesn't happen that way. It's one stroke at the time, one hour at the time, one little piece at the time, so that if the scripture says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself, which Jesus said, and you decide that you're going to allow the spirit of that same Jesus in grace and love and forgiveness and mercy to lift you up, then become one of those men or women committed to the business of lifting up the good, the beautiful, the noble, the worthy, the true. One of the things I like about Jesus is his practical theology. A lot of people have all this theoretical theology. There's a place for it. And I believe in it. I believe I think you ought to have good, clear, rational ideas insofar as reason can take you. But the bottom line is, how does it translate into the practical world? And you know, on this whole story of the ascension, you know, it says how the disciples are all taken because Jesus is being lifted up from them and he's going to go away and they're not going to see him for a long time. And you know what the scripture says? How long are you going to stand there looking up? Don't you like that? You know, how long are you going to stand there meditating on the fact that there are some very high and holy realities? But having seen them, I want you to look out. I want you to look around. I want you to look down. I want you to look in. I want you to go to work. I must work the works of him that sent me while it's still day. For the night comes when no one can work. See, that's our challenge. And so the next time you decide to go to Israel, and you see the Dead Sea, and you have flowered trunks, and an inquisitive mind, and a courageous spirit, then just run out there full speed and jump into the water, and the most amazing thing will happen. You'll bob right back up to the top of it again, because faith is the experience that lifts us from the lower level to the next level and prepares us for the one that is yet to come. Amen. Let us pray. On Memorial Sunday, God, we remember lots of things, but memory is more than looking back. It's looking out and in and around. And so may we have a living kind of memorial where our faith is a lifting and powerful experience. In Jesus' name, amen. The last song.